From Heterodox Academy, this is Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Conversations with scholars and authors, ideas from diverse viewpoints and perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. My guest today is Oliver Berkman. He's a British journalist based in Brooklyn, New York, and he writes for The Guardian. He's also author of The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. We'll be talking about his recent essay, How the News Took Over Reality, in which he argues that excessive engagement with the news has diminished our happiness and has also harmed our democracy. So we're here to talk about your essay, Has the News Taken Over Reality? And your argument in that essay is that political news specifically is taking up too much of our mental space and is having some not so great consequences. Uh, Tell me about the history behind this essay. The idea for this piece came from a sense that I had uh, mainly from a from 2016 onwards. You know, both the presidential election here in the U.S. and the the Brexit referendum in the U.K. That a lot of people, uh, people I knew personally, people I was witnessing in social media, um, and also myself to some extent, were were relating to the news in a, in, a, in a completely new way, such that it was kind of the, the center of gravity of their, their realities. You know, it was, it was that the, the, the news was sort of primarily where the psychological space that they occupied and that, um, you know, their, their so-called real lives, their, their families and homes and neighborhoods were, were somehow secondary. We were sort of marinating in these sort of endless uh, stories of, uh, you know, political conflict and all kinds of, awful and aggravating tales of suffering and crisis and catastrophe in a, in a way that felt uh, new and that going alongside this was a, a real intensification of an idea that there was actually a moral duty to be doing this, that you weren't really uh, playing your role as an upstanding citizen if you were not completely immersed in uh, the news like this pretty much. Round the clock, and and what I wanted to explore in in this piece, some ideas that I've become pretty convinced by, actually, that that um, it's kind of the opposite. That in many ways we may have a moral obligation both to ourselves and and also to the health of democracy to to not be so completely immersed uh, in the news all the time. So you're a journalist, and it's unusual to see a journalist arguing that we should be a bit less engaged with the news. What would you say is the optimal amount of engagement with the news right now? I don't know that I have uh, an answer to that question in a sort of quantitative sense. Uh, I am conscious of the ironies of uh, of a journalist saying this. And I'm also aware that I think the, the, the sort of pathology that I identify here is probably by far worst among journalists and other media people. You know, the sense of uh, the sense of identifying so completely with uh with the news i really don't actually think it's ultimately a question of quantity i don't think i'm going to say like this many hours is is uh, okay and this many hours is is too much it's more uh a sort of basic sense of the relationship i think between you and this this world of the news i think all sorts of factors that we can discuss if you like about how the attention economy operates give the news and related forms of uh, information a really unfair advantage in in sort of burrowing their way into our consciousness. And I think it's incredibly important to stay abreast of a lot of this stuff uh, so that you can take actions that are actually useful, decisions about voting, political activism, uh, charitable contributions, whatever your uh, actions might be, but we have to really try to distinguish that from the idea that simply marinating in more information and the sort of relatively false feeling, I think it's relatively false, that, that you're doing something merely by posting about it or by scrolling down your infinite Twitter feed uh, about it. We have to sort of separate that idea off from the sense that this is actually kind of acting, that this is, is, is taking a stance or doing anything. So I am very much in favor of the news as a source of information. Uh, but I think when it becomes sort of the place where you, where you live, 
I'm not sure it's uh, terrifically useful. One of the things you say in the essay is the way that journalists and television producers have always experienced the news is how millions of other people experience it too now. And it occurred to me that might be true, but maybe it's worse because journalists to some degree also realize that journalism might be a bit of a game and maybe have some detachment from it, whereas maybe regular people do not, or at least some regular people do not. So how similar do you think things are now between people who are just watching the news and and actual journalists? I think that's a fair point to make, especially historically, you know, um, as recently, I mean, even in the 1980s when CNN was providing round the clock, uh, uh, news already, um, it was a pretty rare person who, who spent much more than about an hour, um, actually consuming news on a, on a given day. And if you go back a few more decades, it's astonishing how, how short, say the special news broadcasts for when Pearl Harbor happened, um, there was a completely unprecedented amount of uh, news coverage on the nascent TV stations, and it and it lasted, I think, ninety minutes. Um, the entire special coverage, uh, if I remember correctly, it was on a Sunday, and the engineers would not standardly have been in in the first place at all. So they had mm-hmm. to sort of scramble the whole TV station to even to even be on air. Um, and I'm sure you're right that as that kind of news coverage grew and grew and grew. Uh, journalists did have some kind of distance, a certain jadedness or cynicism or, uh, you know, historically in the UK, I think half of them were drunk half the time. Fortunately, not in the US, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, the the difference, the distinction is is less now because I think that actually the sort of addictive qualities of of social media, the way that it has become really a science to maximize in a very customized way whatever is going to uh, grab you and push your buttons and enrage you. That works for everybody. You know, that, that works on journalists. Uh, I see it all the time as much as it works on, uh, on anybody else. So I do think that at this point, we're all kind of stewing in this, um, what used to be the public sphere and is now, as other people have pointed out, a kind of globalized private sphere where we're all kind of hardwired into each other's, uh, uh, deepest uh, bits of our unconsciousness that are probably usually better kept uh, private. Well, it's one interesting connection is that uh, you talk about this phrase or axiom, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. And it reminded me that a couple of years ago, I was doing some research on why college students might be more anxious. And I came across the scale called the Why Worry Scale. It was created by Canadian psychologists. And there's actually a Why Worry 2 now. And it measures the degree which people believe that worrying has positive characteristics. So it measures five characteristics, including the belief that worry protects against negative uh, negative emotions. It prevents negative things from actually happening if you worry enough. And that worrying itself reflects a positive personality trait. So if you worry, you are inherently virtuous because that is what virtuous people do. And it, it occurred to me that maybe we've now just created a very large set of people who believe that worrying is a manifestation of a virtue, even though it might not be. I I think that's a really excellent way of putting it. I haven't made that connection before, but there is something very clearly uh, similar, I would say, between that sense that worry is constructive uh, and that sense that um, the sort of actions, in quotes, that you take uh, engaging with news on social media are constructive, whether that is liking and posting and retweeting, or whether it's literally just pursuing through clicks and scrolls your particular interest. There's a sense that you are, you know, constructively exploring a world. Um, and yeah, I think I'm, by nature, I'm probably one of the people who think that, uh, subconsciously anyway, that, that fretting about something is, uh, is, uh, likely to prevent uh, catastrophe, and if I stop fretting, uh, you know, ter- terrible things might happen. Um, and yeah, I think obviously it's not just a parallel between worry and uh, and uh, social media activity. I think you're also right that a lot of social media activity is worrying. You know, it is uh, it is people worrying about uh, stuff that's uh, that's going on in the world that is, after all, deeply concerning. I think one thing that I would I think is worth emphasizing um, about that idea of you know if you're not if you're not um, outraged you're not 
paying attention. There's this whole notion that the duty is to attend to things. And I think that what I try to argue in the piece is that that's kind of anachronistic. That's kind of out of date now because that maybe belongs to a time when uh, it was less the case that information was in such a surplus and attention was so scarce. And that relationship between scarce attention and surplus information obviously is, is, is how uh, the social media platforms and, and anyone else who makes money in media these days makes their money um, through, through monetizing attention. And in that situation, it's a little bit strange to say that you sort of have a, have a duty to pay attention because the whole system is designed to extract as much of your attention uh, as, it, as it possibly can. I think what actually arises then is that you have something of a duty to steward your attention. And, um, and that might actually mean not giving it to many, many things that in some kind of abstract sense totally deserve it. I think that's a, that's a good way to sum up that point. Another thing that another parallel between what you were writing about and some of my older research is that, I had a couple of people mention that college students used to live in a bubble and we used to complain that college students were living in a bubble. Um, but part of that bubble was just a matter of structure. There was just one telephone on the hall. Um, you didn't have a television in your dorm room. And to some degree, that was actually healthy because that was a period where you were just coping with several life changes and just being cut away from the world. And now that's just gone for for everyone who has a cell phone. So that's another cause of anxiety now. Right. It's funny to the way we talk about bubbles. Um, you know, you're really talking about something that feels more worthy, I would say of the, of the label bubble, a real kind of, uh, barrier to hearing about things. Bubble strikes me as really not the right word for what we experience in social media today. Right. Because, there are certainly echo chamber effects. There are certainly the effects of being um, uh, exposed to and exposing your views to people who already agree with you. But there's also this effect where because uh, outrage is as good a um, uh, is as good a way of getting people's attention as anything, you also see like the absolute worst views of people who you have absolutely nothing in common with. So people far off the other side of the political spectrum saying uh, absolutely terrible things. Um, I, I'm not in a bubble that screens me from them. People people show them to me on Twitter all the time in the course of mocking or condemning them. And I think possibly there is a there is some research that I recall, I think, that suggests that it's the it's the middle that gets uh, excluded from that. You know, people are not um, are neither particularly excited by nor particularly scornful of uh, um, kind of boringly middle of the line opinions. It's uh, it's the ones at the edges that really uh, that really spread far. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's something to be said for certain kinds of bubbles, uh, but I don't think that's what we're doing now in the in the digital uh, realm, anyway. Another part of your essay is about polarization and depolarization. And uh, you talk about this idea that we need to have more civil conversations about politics with our neighbors and how that might actually not be something we need to do, but rather have more involvement in activities where we don't have to talk about politics. How did you come to that realization? Well, I'm influenced here a lot by a political scientist called Robert Talese, um, who I should give full credit to for, for these ideas. He has a book coming out in a few months called uh, Overdoing Democracy, which pretty much gets at, um, gets at the point. Um, and this is the argument that, uh, you know, we tend to assume as people who value and are committed to democracy that it is a kind of universal uh, solution and response to anything. So if, if, if there are big problems, and uh, goodness knows there are big problems these days in our democracy, that the solution must always be more democracy, right? So more protests and more uh, voter mobilization and more fundraising and whatever. And that definitely has a role. But as Talese uh, points out, you know, democracy at its best is something that we do on a, a sort of wider terrain of civic uh, life that is not all political. So, so democratic 
arguments should be something that we sort of come together to a particular, uh, you know, place to have. And then we go back to this this sort of uh, broader life that, that makes them possible. So when people say the thing that, you know, Democrats really need to be doing is reaching out to people who supported Trump and having conversations and trying to bridge the divide, um, one of the major risks of that, I mean, a, I don't know whether it works, but also it just it just has the general effect of, of making more and more of your life uh, about about politics. Um, meanwhile, if you if you spend all your spare time in your neighbourhood meeting with like minded people to uh, organise politically and uh, canvas or, or whatever, um, then you're subject to all these kind of group polarisation effects, where gradually you sort of sort yourself into into ever more um, narrow. Uh, and to some extent more extreme political uh, groupings. Talese suggests, uh, and it sounds like a good idea to me, that, that what we should actually be doing is is pursuing, as you say, more sort of social, more aspects of social life where politics is just off the agenda. Politics just doesn't come into it, where you relate to people not just as their voter choice, which with the best will in the world, you're still doing when you try to bridge the divide with someone. You're still sort of, we're still defining both parties in that exchange as nothing but uh, political actors. Um, so it's a question less of seeking out the person you hugely disagree with and uh, and trying to reach an agreement, and more about, as he would say, you know, just, I don't know, go to a sport game, go to a gig where you just have no idea whether the people um, alongside you, in front of you, are are on your political side or not. It's hard to do because of all the geographical sorting that's gone on, right? I mean, if I do that uh, here in Brooklyn, New York, uh, it, it, I can, I'm still going to be able to predict to a very close certainty that everyone there has the same, basically the same politics as me. But, but to the extent that it's possible, and it may be more possible in other parts of uh, the country, it's just this idea like we need to relate to people just apolitically, not, not, not trying to compromise in the middle of politics, but just not only doing politics. Right. Well, I think the geographical sorting might be a little overstated, or maybe it's just because I live in Atlanta, but I think there are definitely metropolitan areas around the country that are about 60, maybe 65% Democratic. So uh, not close to 50-50, but definitely when you go to a baseball game or a football game, it's not like you're in Brooklyn, where you can safely assume that everyone has the same political opinions you do. And actually, you know what? I think I'm talking about a, a five mile radius of my, my of my house. I think that um, I think there was a little bit of effort uh, that's doable here, and I've been in contexts where it's uh, where I think I was doing it, and it's it's never it never involves quite as much uh, travel as you uh, as as you might imagine, especially in the UK where I come from, uh, where uh, you know the place is so small anyway. Right, right. So. Um... In terms of creating harmony by having these these segments of our lives um, th- that are apolitical, I think one way someone might push back against that idea as, as a counter argument is: what if there is a time when you say there is a truly fascist political party um, during that period of a country's history? Uh, do, do you want to create harmony, or do you want to have? these these unifying things like watching baseball games it's an interesting form of the criticism because i there is obviously uh, a, a really powerful criticism potential criticism running against all of this which is just that you know uh these things are too are too serious and too acute and too urgent right now to be uh, uh you know worrying about whether we're too immersed in the news or something, you know, you, you, you have to, you have to step up to the moment. And I think most of what I'm, I'm saying here actually meets that criticism. I, I think that, you know, the, the point is that actually immersion in social media is, is to a large extent simply not helpful for um, achieving those goals. And that even when, you know, very strong, uh, political activism is required, as it is now, I would say, 
you know, I think it works better, certainly has worked better for me in my experience in those times when I'm not completely, you know, hypnotized by every new outrage, but that I've chosen, you know, one or two things that are going to be my, uh, my focus, um, where they're local as so far as possible, although that's not always the top priority and, and, and you sort of, and, and you're able to steward your attention in that way. The criticism as applied to the idea of of socializing outside of politics, I mean, all I can really say is I do think that ultimately you want societies to cohere such that after these emergencies have been vigorously dealt with, the society can persist, I think, and the, 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 this idea is certainly better, I think, than the one where we try to find compromise and middle ground and try to say, you know, it's the very good people on both sides right. uh, version of the argument uh, that, that, um, that, you know, we need to somehow get, get to some sort of 50-50 midpoint between, between uh, uh, a decent uh, politics and a completely indecent politics. I don't know, to be honest, what what the whether whether this is an argument for whether that's also an argument for sort of never going to the baseball game because you might be uh, sitting alongside people who who um, who actually support the politics that extreme. My my guess is, from what what I understand, you I think you'll know more about this research than me. Ultimately, the effect of that can if it has any effect, can only be to uh, keep people from spinning off into those extreme positions. But, uh, no, I mean, yeah, may, maybe there are times when that part of this does not work. Well, I, I ask that just because it's something I, I think about based on what I read in applied social psychology. Most applied social psychologists, I think, try to work on creating intergroup harmony but occasionally you'll see a psychologist arguing that harmony is actually not good when there's a power asymmetry mm-hmm. because it just maintains that power sim- asymmetry and it keeps um, the disadvantaged group from from actually d- d- doing things like protesting, doing things that disrupt the harmony so that they they get the rights they deserve. There was an issue of psychological inquiry some time ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, where there was an interesting debate about this issue. It's not one where I have a clear side i just know what's happening within that mm. world and i i find it interesting the question there is whether the i mean i totally agree with that yeah actually that that i or can certainly see the the case for it that there are times when harmony between groups should not be the the goal um i do wonder though if this idea of um stepping away from politics applies to that in the same way because you're I, 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 well, I mean, I, I guess I'm repeating myself. So, but, but it's the, it's this notion that, that harmony between different political groups may not always be appropriate. But the idea of stepping outside of politics and understanding that literally everybody you're dealing with is, in some sense, a human being, uh, I, I find it very hard to imagine the context in which that isn't ultimately going to be uh, something that is positive for the health of a society. Right, that common humanity idea. Right, but not but common. You can't reach. I don't think you can reach that by by trying to see the reasonableness of everybody's political opinions. I think that uh, you've probably got to accept that some people's are not going to be. Uh, uh, you're not going to be able to define them as reasonable by any standards. Right, right. So, on a somewhat different topic, I just wanted to wanted to talk about your work on happiness because I know you've written a book about that and. I teach a course on happiness. Are you, um, well, tell me a bit about that book and where you're taking that work. So I wrote a book called The Antidote. The subtitle is Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. And um, I really just started from my own aversion to uh, the culture of being constantly told to think positive or to, or, and, and a broader kind of positive thinking. Often it's not explicit. Most people, you know, are a bit cynical about that kind of really cliched version of it but just this general idea that the way to have a happy life is to uh use your conscious will to fill your mind with good feelings or to uh i think striving 
making very, very clear goals and relentlessly striving towards them is another example of it. Um, and I had found writing this weekly column in The Guardian about about this kind of stuff, I had found again and again that, that, that the ideas that resonated with me, the techniques that worked, um, the philosophies that really uh, stayed with me, none of them were about that. All of them were about uh, trying to become uh, friendlier with um, negative emotions, trying to become more sort of capacious uh, when it comes to being able to hang out with failure or uncertainty or sadness. And, you know, I think uh, meditation and that whole that whole trend at its best is, is about that. And uh, some of the renewed interest in stoicism is about that, although some of it isn't. I'm less keen on that. But, uh, you know, so, so there's a, a general kind of and I think it actually does in a way it, it connects to our earlier part of our conversation because, you know, I think we should be hoping to have fulfilling lives and we don't live at a point in history where um, we're just, uh, you know, trying to make everything go really, really, really well is necessarily seem like a very uh, practical means to that. We're going to have to sort of be living in a world with uh, severe environmental threats and huge amounts of political aggravation and, and all the rest of it and and somehow try to understand what it means to be happy or at least have meaningful lives in that in that context and you won't get there by just uh, you know screening out all the bad stuff yeah it's one interesting thing i've noted is the critics of the happiness industry tend to not be american they tend to be british or australian and i feel like the the culture has something to do with that. I, I myself am pretty skeptical of big parts of the ha the happiness industry. And one of the books I recommend to my students is The Happiness Trap. And the first chapter in that book is the description of the trap, which is this idea that there's something wrong with you if you're not happy or you can't think positively all the time. So uh, are you planning to do anything more in that area? Well, that that broad, I mean, I tell you what has always, I, I'm not, I'm working on a, another book at the moment that's not about happiness in any direct sense but the thing that seems to really uh always draw me and crop up in one way or another in everything i do really is is the the idea of the sort of ironic effect that's at the heart of that book and of the happiness trap idea i think um that there are all sorts of things in life where the more effort you put into trying to do them the the, the harder it gets to attain them and i think that really is true of happiness um but i think it's true of lots of other things as well and i'm uh, i'm right now very interested in how much of our sort of uh culture about around productivity and uh and sort of hyper efficient time management seems to just make people busier and more burned out which suggests that it's not really doing what it uh, says on the label all right well, there, there are definitely a lot of a lot of professors who feel burned out. So maybe when that book comes out, I should interview you again. Uh, I will happily uh, I'll happily talk about it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for asking me. Thanks for tuning in, and for those of you who came to the Heterodox Academy conference. Thank you for attending the conference. Several of you came up and said hello to me, and I really appreciate that. Uh, there's a link to Oliver Berkman's essay in the show notes, as well as links to a couple of other pieces by him that you might like, and a link to his book. The next guests on the show are Kaylin O'Connor, who's a philosopher of biology and has a new book about misinformation and how it spreads. After that, we'll have Joanna Shug. She's a cross-cultural psychologist, and she'll be talking about how we can understand cultures that are different from ours. I'll also have an episode featuring short interviews with people who were at the conference, both people who spoke and just people who attended. There will also be an episode in early September with Lara Schwartz, who was at the conference. She's the director of the American University Project on Civil Discourse. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps other people find out about the show. And you can also follow me on Twitter at ChrisMartin76. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook.